Good morning to all of you watching uh, live. Uh, you and Sundry are watching me today on the big screen uh, in Uganda. Um, you guys are watching me, Kakir, and to your family. I um, thank you for staying up late tonight to watch this confirmation service. Um, we have uh, uh, three young people who are going to be confirmed today, and uh, we're very excited about that. Um, and it's very exciting to come back here to Mistatum. Um, this church feels as much like home for me as any church that I know because it is the home of one of my best friends uh, who sat in these very pews many years ago. And uh, I should tell you all, I was at his son's ordination the other day. Terry's son, uh, Jay, was ordained and uh, um, at Panoka. And he's got a very nice congregation and he's, he's very excited about his ministry. And so uh, we have uh, that event and uh, Ian was there and the rest of the family, we got to see everyone. And um, I know they too think very, very fondly of, of Mistatum. Tyson must be, is he here? Yeah. Tyson, if you'd come up, oh, he's back there. You, you got him, okay. Um, we're going to begin our service today. Uh, does everyone have a bulletin? We'll begin our service today. Now this is a confirmation service and I am going to uh, um, sanitize my hands uh, fanatically and then I will give out communion this morning um, but like I say I will I, I will drop the wafer in your hands so I don't touch you and uh, and I will sanitize crazy before we have communion so uh, to just so you know that the communion service is I'm using is out of the green hymnal not the not the brown hymnal and uh, if this Roman was six feet tall, and you guys can't see it at home, but I have Roman armor sitting over here. If this Roman was six feet tall, his name would be Maximus. But we're going to refer to him as Minimus, because he's, he's, he's awful short. And uh, we're going to be talking about putting on the armor of God and what that means. Because when Paul wrote about putting on the armor of God, I have zero doubt that he wasn't looking at that, exactly that, uh, when, he, when he said what he said. And so he uh, spoke about the breastplate and the helmet and, and so on and so on. And uh, I did not bring uh, a sword or spear into the church. Um, but, uh, anyways, that's just, I guess, a, a choice. So with that in mind, we will begin our service. Uh, the congregation in Sundry also has this bulletin, so they will also be able to join, join in. And so let us all, uh, now, do you still, do you stand or does everybody just stay seated? Is it okay if you stand? Okay, then let's all please rise and uh, join together in the brief order for confession and forgiveness. Let us together. Gracious Creator, you have given us so much, but too often we take those gifts for granted or as something to which we are entitled. You call us to live in caring community, but too often we place our wants and needs first and those of others a distant second. You call us to share your gifts with the world around us, but we are worried that they may not be enough, and our worrying gets in the way of our sharing. For all the times when we mistreat and misuse your gifts, for all the times we assume that we get what we have by ourselves, forgive us and lead us back to the path of wisdom. Time of silent prayer. And so we'll just take a few moments now and just bow our heads in, in, in prayer.
God is a gracious giver. God is gracious in forgiveness. God calls us to new patterns and new life. We are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen. We can't have a Lutheran confirmation service without singing a mighty fortress. So uh, it is in the Lutheran service book, number 657, uh, sundry in your red hymnal. I don't know the page number, but I'm sure you have it. Uh, a mighty fortress is our God. And uh, you can sing, sing along. Uh, I guess you'll mostly just hear me. But let us, let us sing. at this time, and uh, Garth, if you'd come forward. Just stand right close to me so that they can hear you, please. You can take your mask off so you're nice and loud. First lesson is from Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. 
The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust, there may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in all love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burden, but that is a matter of fairness. Your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, and there be, may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. And whoever gathered little has no lack. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. It is good that you and I have got good eyes. Oh, smokes, this small. Um, the, gospel, the gospel lesson today is from Mark 5, 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell to his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little girl is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And she had suffered so much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and was still no better, but grew worse. She had heard stories about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment because she believed that if she just touched even his garment, she would be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt her body and she was healed of her disease. 
And Jesus perceived in himself that power had been gone out from him. And immediately he turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, Are you kidding me? You see the crowd all around, pressing around you. And yet you say, Who touched me? How would we know? But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And I'm guessing that that truth involved statements like, I believe, I have faith, I knew that. I believe that if I touched you, I would be made well. Because again and again and again, it was faith that made people well. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, just believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John and the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion. There were people crying and wailing loudly because a little girl had just died. And they came to that house and when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making such a commotion? This child isn't dead, she's just sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, sit up. And immediately the little girl got up and began walking because she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. You may be seated. That is my favorite gospel lesson, and I wish it was a good gospel lesson for confirmation. It isn't. My gospel, the, the lesson I'm going to be speaking on today is from Paul's discussion of putting on the armor of God. And so I'll be talking about that. But before I do that, we will sing our uh, next song. This is a song that... Uh, we have sang here many times, God Loves Me Dearly, number 392, and uh, I'll sing the first verse uh, by myself, and then, the, then you, the organ can start up and we'll all sing together. So 392, and it's certainly too bad that Wilfred isn't here. He used to love, love when I sang this song. God is the liebe, er liebt auf Lesen. God is the liebe, er liebt auf mich. Drum sag ich noch einmal, God is the liebe. God is the liebe, er liebt auch mich. God loves me dearly, grants me salvation. God loves me dearly, you can all sing along. Loves even me, therefore I'll say again, God loves me dearly. God loves me dearly, loves even me. I was in slavery, sin, death, and darkness. 
God love was working to make me free. Therefore I'll say again, God loves me dearly, God loves me dearly, loves even me. He sent forth Jesus, my dear Redeemer, He sent forth Jesus and set me free. Therefore I'll say again, God loves me dearly, God loves me dearly, loves even me. Last verse, verse 5. Now I will praise you, O love eternal. Now I will praise you all my life long. God loves me dearly, God loves me dearly, loves even me. I uh, used to own two uh, types of Roman armor, and uh, this is the armor that a centurion would wear. And I wish there was some way to show you guys at home. Uh, you'll just have to take my word for it that there's armor here. And uh, today uh, we welcome these confirmation students. I honestly don't think I ever had a better class of kids. Uh, we had fun, we had fainting, we had all sorts of pizza. Uh, we had uh, a wonderful time at, at Wilfred's and Marjorie's. And is Marjorie here today? No? Oh, I wish she had come. Oh, is she watching? Oh, good. Well, Marjorie, thank you for letting us be in, in your home. And uh, we, we had a lot of fun. And... Uh, one of the things that you think about when you think of young people is their quality. What kind of person are they going to be? And there are three, very, can I get you guys to scooch this way so I can see, see Tyson? I, I can't see, see you hiding behind there. Um, we have three quality people here. These are good people and gifted people. These, these three, are gifted in so many ways. Sincerity, uh, a willingness to learn, uh, respect. They've treated, treated me with such respect. They are, are three young people who are gonna go very far and are gonna achieve great things. And now they are taking up a position as young adults in this church. This is your church. I've never understood why in churches we confirm young people and then tell them they can't do anything until they're 18. It doesn't make sense. There should even be place for you on council. Um, because at your age, you have ideas and visions that are quite different than adults and add a great deal to uh, the church and the life of the church. Well, one quality that we don't like in the world, of course, is the violence that exists. And there has never been, and never will be, other than perhaps the Mongols, but I doubt even if they were any worse than Julius Caesar, a people as violent as the Romans. This particular uh, armor comes from the second century and it is true to the last detail. It, uh, this was, as I said, this is a centurion's riding outfit. This was a centurion who rode. And um, 
I'll just get to the parts here in a second. Um, an occupation of past wars that was so important, of course, was the blacksmith. And this, this armor was actually made by a blacksmith just outside of the city of Rome. Uh, this fellow makes this stuff and then sells it here in, in Canada, the United States. And uh, we bought two pieces of it. Terry Lutz and I bought two pieces of it for our King of Kings play. And I ended up with it when the play uh, finally came to an end. I don't exactly know how I did that. I probably swiped it. It's uh, so much for my qualities, huh? Um, but when I think of armor, I think of Rome. And I've had, as I say, an interest in Roman armor and armaments my whole life. I think I don't know how many books I've read on the subject. But they controlled the world for almost a thousand years. And it wasn't by accident. Their armor was the best in the world. And God gave them the wisdom, the knowledge to rule and to create armor like this. And you might say, well, what would God have anything to do with that? Well, the reason was, is that God was preparing the way. He brought along uh, Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great instilled a language over the whole Western world, Greek. And Greek became the language of, of Ethiopia, of Egypt, of Italy, of all of Gaul, of well, all of the Mediterranean, and then all the way as far as India, Greek. And when Alexander died, his generals were put in charge of all the nations of the world, and Greek became the main language. So now we have a language that's common, and everyone can read it, and, and it's so precise and so defined. Now we need order, and God brings the Romans in. And the Romans build roads so that missionaries can travel. The Romans bring safety and security so that for three years Jesus can travel and do his ministry and be safe. And the Romans brought their form of torture and punishment, which was provided for Jesus Christ, the cross. So it's incredibly important that we realize that this is the stuff of God. And so today I have Minimus here. This is the helmet. It weighs eight pounds. It's called a coolus. And this is a coolus supremus because it has a plume on top. That's real horse hair and it's been dyed with berries from, again, from, from Italy. Covering the shoulders and the body is the solmentia. Uh, you've probably seen, and, and I used to have an outfit, by the way, it's in at the gun shop in Tisdale, up on the wall. If you go in the gun shop, it's, it's up top. Uh, I traded it for, for a handgun. And uh, it's, that, that's called segmentia, which is scales. This is, this is a single piece, solus. One piece, solus solmentia. And this single piece could take the blow of an arrow. Uh, it could take uh, the swing of an ax even. It, it would dent. And, and that was the other trick that they learned was they started making armor that was brittle. But when it was hit hard, it would break. So they developed armor that gave a little. So when you hit it, it dented instead of allowing the, the object to go straight through it. Under the armor was this very, very, this very, very heavy wool outfit. And it's very short, but the men in those days were also very short. Uh, five foot five was considered a pretty good sized man. And um, so under was this. Uh, under some officers, they would wear silk because the silk would allow, if the arrow went into your body, 
the silk would go with it and they could pull the silk out and pull the arrow out along with the silk. Um, covering their lower arms are, were a thing called arm greaves. And they, there wasn't much to them. Uh, some of them, this, this one here, this is a wrist greave. These went on their wrists and these were heavy, heavy leather to block, there we are, to block a knife blade. And then these were the leg greaves and they uh, went on the calves and then they had similar ones that went on the forearms. And they were exactly like this. They would put these little metal pieces here because they wanted to catch the sword. When the sword came in, they didn't want it glancing off, off, off of this onto the body. So these little metal pieces were meant to catch the blade when it hit. And the last part, uh, this part at the bottom with all the leather strips, that is called the scrotarum. And uh, you can guess what that was supposed to protect. <laughs> um, and it uh, had a whole bunch of leather straps and again, a bunch of metal pieces sewn onto it to capture the blade. Because when, when a blade was swung and, oh, now the guy's got it stuck in your leather, well, now you, you got a free hand to come around and, and end the fight. Everyone who ever wore such a suit of armor put on all the pieces. The shield, I actually built one once. Uh, I, I built it to the specs of, of Rome. I, I, it had a curved edge so that they would hook, one shield would hook into another and create a wall. And they would, I mean, they'd hook really well into each other and you could not pull them apart. And uh, it was made out of lathing, leather, and then more lathing, and they weighed 18 pounds. And uh, the one I made uh, was also equipped with uh, Valerie's salad plate and her salad bowl, stainless steel, turned inside out. Um, then they also had a, a sword that they fought with, and it was a stabbing, stabbing sword, and they had a pilum, which was a long, spear and that was also genius the metal on the pilum was soft so when you would throw it and it would hit the opposition shield it would bend so nobody could pull it out throw it back at you as a matter of fact most of the times you couldn't pull it out so now you have this bent thing hanging on your shield and it would slow you down just ingenious stuff so smart but as i say no one would go into battle without three pilums, without your gladius, your sword, without a gladius spetarum, which is the, the, the small stabbing dagger, and all of these, these things. When all was said and done, you had 46 pounds of leather and steel and another about 16 pounds of sword and pilum. And so these guys were tough. Likewise, with the Apostle Paul, who, as I say, I had no doubt that he was looking at a soldier that looked exactly like this. When he wrote what he wrote, Paul is advising us to put on the whole of the armor of God, not just bits and pieces of it. We are to protect ourselves from the cunning onslaught of the power of evil that is keenly aware of where we are vulnerable. And the power of evil, one always attacks us where we don't have protection. Satan will go after you where you are the weakest. Had a young man a few days ago inform us that he was in fact gay. He's no more gay than a fence post, but he was tempted into something. He was tricked into something 
And now he is struggling. His whole family's been turned upside down. Satan knows where to attack. He knows how to hurt individuals and families. He knows where our soft spots are. So you wear a full body of armor. So how do we apply what Paul is teaching to us today? I believe we are living in a battlefield. And I believe that all around us are angels and demons. Now you might think that, oh, what is this? This guy's got screws loose. He's another one of these dough heads. And, you know, I've, I told you the story. Uh, whether you believe me or not, I, I don't know. But when I was in the hospital in, in uh, Nippawin, praying for a man at his bed, um, I was praying that God would send angels to help this fellow from this life to the next. I told you, I felt a hand on my wrist. The hand moved, the thumb moved. I could feel it squeeze and let go, squeeze and let go. I looked, I couldn't see anything. I know it's real because I have felt the presence of an angel. And if there are angels, then there are also demons around us trying with all their might to lead us astray. And we're not fighting simply with our own egos, with our own selfishness. We're not fighting simply with our own flesh, with our own little addictions and our own passions. We're not merely fighting pedal, petty battles with booze or drugs or sex or, or material pleasures. The Bible says that we are fighting with an evil force greater than ourselves. And that that force is only turned aside by the power of Christ Jesus. Who causes all the wars around us? Who causes all the pain and the suffering? What always bothers me, and it bothers me to no end, is when someone says, why did God do that? Why did God let a little child die of cancer? Why did God, you know, God didn't. That's not the stuff of our God. That's the stuff of evil that we have taken part of, and because of that, we're all broken. And life is temporal. temporal. Accidents happen. People die. Brought on by our own sinfulness and the world's humanity. We're human. And so we sin and we fail and we break. I buried my granddaughter a week ago. A week and a half ago. And of course someone asked, how could God have done this? God didn't. It was an accident. Somehow inside the womb, she moved in such a way that a knot was formed in the umbilical cord and she died. It's not the stuff of God. It's the stuff of the temporality of our lives. It's the stuff of the brokenness that we are part of. We try to hide from it. We create illusions that all is well. We stay away from church and we stay away from spirituality for whatever reason, biases, dislikes, likes, or sheer laziness. We create sanctuaries of beautiful homes and amazing vehicles vacation spots that we can run to. We create all these things, but in the end, we cannot escape the slings and the arrows of that which is evil. You will find that the snake lives in paradise. The snake was found in the Garden of Eden. And the snake is working invisibly in our little gardens as well. 
Now you can become apathetic to the world around you. You can, again, believe that the stuff I'm saying today is absolute nonsense. But look no farther than what COVID has done to our lives. What the nature of sickness can bring to the world. Rather than running away from the battles of life and the powers of apathetic evil living, instead, Paul has another alternative. He has a battle plan for Christians. Living in the real world, filled with evil and injustice, Paul is so wise in describing each piece of necessary armor. We read that we are to put on the whole armor of God because we're not dealing with the passions of the flesh, but the passions and the powers of darkness. He begins to describe the first piece of armor. He says, first put on the belt of truth. This belt around his waist, so wide, so protective. Truth in all relationships, truth about God, truth to your spouse, truth to your children, truth to your friends. If you are truthful, if you are a person who can be trusted, life goes so much better for you and those around you. We grasp the truth. We hold to the truth. Christ was called the truth. It's a lot harder than it sounds. It's a lot harder to hold to the truth than it sounds. Then he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Right relationships. The breastplate, this big steel piece on the front. The breastplate of righteousness, good relationships with all those around you, to be in right relationships with God, to be in right relationships with your folks, to be in right relationships with all those around you. Because this world attacks relationships. Satan tries to set child against parent, cause trouble between us. Jobs, health, education, family, pressures of all sorts on relationships. So put on the breastplate of righteousness. Then put on foot protectors of peace. Not to be looking for a fight with yourself. Now the Roman sandal had steel spikes on the bottom so they could get better grip. That alone made a huge difference in battle. On the top was a leather, leather thong that came up and up the front of the leg that could take a spear blow or, or a sword slice. Put on the foot protectors of peace, not to be looking for a fight with yourself, a member of this church family or someone else, but trying to work through the legitimate conflicts that are always found and having the footing from which to do battle against evil. Being able to hold fast. Then put on the shield of faith. To trust God. To trust that God is with you. To trust that when you're at the grave of a, of a child that has died. That it is God who's at your side weeping with you. He is your shield. You can step behind him. Let him bear the pain. To trust that God is with you. Put on the shield of faith. Then put on the helmet of salvation. What a gift to know that we're saved. That there is nothing you can do to earn or merit it. That it's been given to you as a gift. I've told you that how many times, didn't I? I over and over again. It's not how good you are or what your decision might be. It's what Jesus did on the cross. That was the work that saves us. And it's faith in him and in the grace that he offers us that brings us that eternal life. And put on the sword of the spirit of God that is the word of God. 
There is power in the Bible. Take time each day to read the Word of God. I don't know whether you guys have a devotional life. I hope you do. If you don't, start. Read a little bit of the Word every day. I, I don't care if it's a paragraph. But that is like a great part of the armor of fighting against evil to be involved in the Word of God. The words of Jesus, of the Apostle Paul, and the Old Testament aren't merely words printed on pages of dusty old book that we pull out when the preacher is coming or when we have an occasional death or baptism or Bible devotional. God's word is alive. And all that I taught you is alive within you. And I hope will equip you for life. God's word. I, I remember a professor years ago telling us that, that when you speak the words of the Bible, the words don't flow out and then fall to the ground. When they're spoken, they are alive. They go into the bodies and the minds of people around and they influence. We learn them, we memorize them, we recite them. And finally, put on praying in the spirit. Take time to pray. Take time to speak to your heavenly father. Now, you're not parents yet, but when you are, and I'll, I can ask you guys, is there anything in your world greater than when your child comes and wants to visit with you? There's nothing. That's the best. That's as good as it gets. When I get a text message from my son or my daughter, it gets answered immediately because they're the most important people in my life. You are the most important people in God's life. In God's heaven, he created you as the crowning glory of his creation. Nothing is as important, so much so that he was willing to let his son die on a cross for you. So speak to him, talk to the Lord, spend time in prayer. And so the Apostle Paul clearly and wisely says to you confirmants this morning, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand tall in the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, to you folks at home, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to turn off at this point. Uh, the confirmation service is uh, one that I'll be moving around up here and you can't follow along with it. So I'll say so long and, and God bless you and love you all. And we'll see you uh, next Sunday and sundry. And thank you for watching today. Take care. Bye bye.